Before I formally begin the introduction, I would like to uh, maybe make a couple of comments. Uh, so far, um, we've heard from John Todd about the optimism of the capacity of human intelligence to solve problems and heal and regenerate living systems, which I think was a, a very appropriate and inspiring introductory keynote, followed this morning by Peter Richards' presentation. It reminded us that subtropical design is not necessarily a set of rules that uh, generate automatic results, but rather it's a cultural manifestation, which I found also a, a very powerful message. And um, with these presentations, I want everyone to, to keep in mind that we have a wiki site uh, for the development of a declaration of principles that we'd like for you to participate in, if you haven't already, to log on and enter your thoughts as we try to imagine or try to think about some common goals, common principles that all of us can take away from this conference uh, and share with our communities, a set of principles that apply to subtropical cities around the world. Um, our next speaker, Bruno Stagno is a principal of Bruno Stagno Arquitecto y Asociados from Costa Rica. Bruno is the founder and director of the Instituto de Arquitectura Tropical, or the Institute for Tropical Architecture, which combines concepts of tropical architecture with those of an international contemporary architecture. Bruno focuses his practice on the communion of building with nature juxtaposing tradition and innovation. His work embodies the principles of critical regionalism in a time where globalization is a dominant force. Mr. Stagno has developed an intense active practice focusing on the maximum exploitation of climatic characteristics of the tropics, logical use of materials, and emphasis on tropical biodiversity in the landscape. He endorses the concept of more design than technology for sustainable architecture in developing countries, and I would extend that to all countries. Born in Santiago, Chile, and a Costa Rican national, he has studied architecture at the Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile, which is the National Catholic University of Chile in Santiago, and the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. His work has been exhibited and collected in numerous publications and meetings, such as the Venice Biennale in 2004. He is the author of Bruno Stagno, an architect in the tropics, and Ciudades Tropicales Sostenibles, um, Sustainable Tropical Cities. He is also co-author of Tropical Architecture, Critical Regionalism in the, Glo in the Age of Globalization. Bruno Stagno was a recipient of the Prince Klaus Fund for Culture and Development in 1997, and the first award in architecture at the 8th Santo Domingo International Biennial of Architecture in 2006. He was awarded the Union Panamericana de Arquitectos Award for his research and diffusion of tropical architectural knowledge in Costa Rica in 2005, and he was a finalist in the Living Steel International Competition for Sustainable Housing in Kolkata, India in 2006. His design for the Holcim Costa Rica office building in San Jose reduces energy demand through natural lighting and ventilation, achieving this at a rel relatively modest cost in presenting a striking and attractive appearance which provides a stimulating work environment. This project was named by the Spanish version of GEO magazine as one of the five pioneering sustainable buildings in the world. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Bruno Stagno. Thank you very much, Tony. It is a great pleasure to be here and to share with you some of my projects and ideas. And also it is a great honor to participate in this seminar. Thank you very much, Tony, for the invitation and for the well, warm welcome. I'm not going to take more time that uh, I'm allowed to than uh, 
But first of all, you see on the title of my presentation, Floresta Urbana. Uh, it's not the same, but it's almost the same that urban forest. But uh, I will keep the Spanish name during my presentation. I am used to introduce myself as an architect with two hats. One hat as the founding director of the Institute for Tropical Architecture, and the second hat as the principal of Bruno Stagno Architects. My experience is on tropical architecture. This is a decision I made a few years after moving to the tropics and taking up the challenge it represented. Since 1973, as an immigrant, I began re-reading the modern movement from an environmental perspective and started valuing the significance of environment, climate, latitude, and their determinism in architecture. This concern gave rise to many reflections and articles to understand and clear up my situation in this new environment and to outline the, gui the guidelines of my practice. Each building added elements that define ways to adapt to the weather and the tropical cultural surroundings. Landscaping, cities, and especially tropicality were included in architecture. These reflections increasingly captured my time and attention, and I understood that there was an unlimited field to explore, and when the time came, I developed more formal and bigger researches. This is why, in 1994, I founded with a group of friends and colleagues the Institute for Tropical Architecture in San Jose, Costa Rica, which was immediately recognized by the government as a non-for-profit and of public interest institution. Two years later, with the award granted by the Prince Klaus Fund for Culture and Development of the Netherlands, we organized at the Institute for Tropical Architecture the first architecture tropical encounter in San Jose, attended by 10 architects of the latitude. The lectures of these encounters and with the personal support of the Prince Klaus, I published in England together with Alexander Sonis and Lian Lefebvre the book Tropical Architecture, Critical Regionalism in the Age of Globalization. At the present time, we have already organized four encounters and we have published 10 books, among them, Sustainable Tropical Cities, Biodiversity in Tropical Landscape, and four books with the 40 lectures of the four tropical encounters. The Institute is the author of RESET, a certification norm for sustainable buildings in the tropic that will be soon recognized as a national norm. The Institute has other activities like the online editorial with 81 published articles who can download it for free. The activities of the Institute are open and free. The Institute has, has life of its own and it is doing well. It has been endorsed by the International Union of Architects and its web is visited by people from more than 90 countries. Developing architecture of this latitude has been a constant challenge and also has led me through different paths. This journey has been nourished by traditional architecture and local architects that have committed it during centuries. Our challenge is to discover resources of this tropicality and enlighten new architectural form that come from them. 
We acknowledge the need for shading and protection from the sun and the rain, the need for open and ventilated space, and the careful use of technology. We privilege design and build bioclimatic architecture based on the proper use of resources. This has been a constant challenge that brings together research and practice and makes an effort to create avant-garde buildings with an adapted and coherent architecture. Presentation of the tropics. In Latin America, only in Chile and Uruguay, there is no tropical region. And from the 192 states member of the United Nations, 180 countries are located in areas where the climate is tropical or subtropical, which represent around 35% the area of the planet. In relation to population, the tropics cover nearly half of the world's population. At this latitude is where growth is faster. Besides, here are many of the largest cities. It is important to remember that ecosystem in the subtropical latitude and tropical latitude and its biodiversity and size represent 61% of the wild protected areas are increasingly indispensable for planet sustainability. Its increasing importance is balance. Life of the biosphere makes us consider them carefully. The tropic is not only a climatic zone, it is also a cultural category with its own characteristic affected by tropicality. Now, I would like to show you some buildings and projects we have designed. They are all small buildings with small budgets, and most of them are located in the 10th parallel north at, at uh, 4,000 feet high in Costa Rica. I would also go with you through the explanation of sustainable tropical architecture with more design than technology. Technology and avant-garde. As far as possible, I choose the cheapest and most abundant material and I lean on the skills of local workforce. I pick metal tubes for the structure, cement blocks, corrugated metal sheets for roofing, cellulose cement flat sheets, plants and trees as climatic conditioning, and glass. Although this last one is more expensive, I compensate it designing a low-cost window frame. If this attitude is combined with an avant-garde thinking, the result, the result are going to be vanguard without depending on the novelties of the technological market. I believe that vanguard is a mental attitude and a commitment. It cannot be reduced to materials with sex appeal and fashionable devices, as some people have wanted to believe, for the simple reason that these buildings stop being avant-garde when their materials and equipment are overcome by other latest generation. This is why this architecture are so ephemeral and last as long as the surprise does. When one mistakenly believe architecture is avant-garde because it uses sophisticated materials, mechanism, apparatus, and gadgets, and not due to the suitability of the spaces of life, or for its basis quality and serenity, were faced with confusion proper of consumerism. Buildings designed this way have a short lifespan and soon stop bringing excla exclamations, surprises, contribution, and lessons. They are soon forgotten or demolished. Confusing avant-garde with high technology seems to be a mistake since Vanguard, to me, is proposing the opportune and adequate answer to a historical instant that is approaching. Presently, I am more sensitive to the need of reducing consumption, therefore, 
there is not just one architecture of avant-garde, but all that are oriented in that direction which adapt of its circumstances and because they exalt the differences. Elevated roof and free space. When architects waterproof the ground by paving, it, they concentrate more water on rivers and streams. To rise construction above the natural ground has its own benefits. Free space means absence of wall, free of airflow, freedom of protected space, unobstructed view, children at play, transparency and direct relation with the nearby vegetation. Regardless of its use, it is always a gain. Sometimes it may represent more investment. However, the comparison cost benefit is always favorable if economy, if applied and, and environmental contribution are added. Palladio's Piano Nobile was a solid pedestal anchored to the ground and it was essential to his massive architecture. On the contrary, free space is an empty stand that elevates the building and symbolizes freedom. It is the tropical space, cool and shaded. Building elevated above natural ground are an interesting resource for the tropics. For Le Corbusier, stilts mean the continuity of space of the horizontal level. Moreover, in the tropical latitude, they mean an interrupted breeze and rainwater flows, as well as the free movement of people, animals, and insects, the isolation of humidity, and the availability of an extra covered space. Tropical roof. It is well known that tropical rain, because of its concentrated amount in a short period of time, is an essential factor of roof design. Flows can bring serious problems. Combining freshness and illumination is a contradiction for bioclimatic tropical architecture because we know that light is accompanied by heat. Nevertheless, we have built some buildings that call for illumination from the Senate, as the one I am now presenting to you. In this project, I introduce natural light into the heart of the building to achieve a double-oriented illumination for the offices, but by doing so, I am also introducing heat. I resolve the excess of heat by injecting a horizontal earth, natural air stream that isolated this heat in a bubble that remained at the top of the pyramid. The values of the temperature and luminosity can be appreciated in the sketch. Solar radiation is another determinant factor in roofing. The average maximum temperature for year is 77 Fahrenheit, and the average minimum is 72 and the average relative humidity is 70. These measurements are from the central plateau in Costa Rica. It is a climate with no extreme, reduced thermal amplitude and characterized by its constant variation between maximum and minimums. In a climate with these characteristics, buildings do not need thermal insulation either in walls or floors. However, in the roof it is necessary in order to avoid sun radiation and condensation. A 12 micro aluminum sheet placed directly under the roof reflects 93% of the heat. And then a three inches cushion of isolation resolves the problem of sun radiation. Inhabitable covered roof. The great advantage of tropical architecture is the potential use of covered outer space since temperature is always pleasant. An example of this is the inhabitable covered roof protected from sun and rain. It is an additional space with good condition because breeze always refreshes it. 
Static benefits are added to view when the building is on a street with abundant trees. The sum of many covered flat roof in a city or neighborhood could create a new inhabitable level with practical and special values adapted to the latitude. This inhabitable cover roof is the substitute for the lack of available urban land. The scarcity of build-up land is a chronic problem in cities. Therefore, any inhabitable elevated space is welcome. Having these additional areas pays of the high cost per built up square foot. There are more advantages when we add environmental and ecological benefits. These spaces are suitable for garden or orchard, more and more necessary in a society whether to increase food or to complement the diet. Mitigation of carbon generation and reduction of rainwater runoff are other advantages. Finally, it is the space for the hammock, an invention of the tropic that can move to more favorable shade and breeze. The materialized facade. For us, the intelligent glass facade is just an interesting contribution with a, a huge limitation because it is not easily replicable to its high cost. Besides, it is unnatural to the tropical latitude. Buildings seem maladjusted. It is like seeing Houston buildings in the middle of the Amazon forest. Personally, we prefer the dematerialized facade with different elements designed specially to fulfill the functions of the intelligent glass facade. We put eaves to keep away the sun. We do not use electric impulses or input to darken windows. We reduce high temperature with parasols placed strategically. Visors and marquees help the parasols with this job. Vegetation generates shade. Wings to direct the inner wind flow, improving cross ventilation and fixed or operable louvers regulate the amount and direction of the incoming breeze. This group of elements separated of the glass wall as a bioclimatic structure allows the window to open and be protected from rainfall. They let the air flow through this facade, which cools it and leaves it in shade. They allow the building maintenance and also to understand the functional character of each element. Maybe the most important aspect is dematerialized facade have the great potential to characterize the project, expressing the latitude. Moreover, it reinforces architectural, ex architectural ex expressiveness, something that is getting lost out of the rising internationalization of today's building. This is why it is important to make users interact with the environment through the dematerialized facade and attain passive buildings for active people. Six, the space of tropical shade. In, architecture, in tropical architecture, space is suitable when it is under a roof with steep pitches because it creates a big space near the ceiling and a horizontal and area associated with the surrounding. It is a different situation from Miss van der Rohe space, which extends around and beyond interior walls between planar form where beams disappear, columns dematerialize and walls are eliminated. Just as there is clarity in a horizontal direction in Miss van der Rohe space, in the tropical space there is ambiguity. On one hand, there is an evident relation with the environment and simultaneously a clear intention to keep it under the high roof. Shade is very important because it is a counterpoint 
that reinforces this. Shade is not dar darkness, neither the opposite of light. Both light and shade have a positive connotation if we analyze them from experiences. For example, in cold climate, sunlight and heat invite people to get together. On the contrary, in torrid, hot tropical climate, shade does it and invite them to stay and talk. In the same way as light is synonym of heat, shade is of freshness. Here we have two valid connotations adapted to their own latitude and experiences. This is why space in tropical architecture has been traditionally shaped by shade and all its form obtained when diminishing the environment brightness. Shade means also glaze and reflections and shiny surfaces. It offers many possibilities to model the space. This search for, cha for shade and its quality is something very important and extensible to the entire tropical latitude. Therefore, we say we design an architecture in light of shade. More design than technology. I have already told you that the harness comfort through climate, it is important to appropriate use of light, shade, temperature, earth, humidity, and breeze. We architects have made the mistake of delegating well-being responsibility on engineers and technology, leaving behind an important part of the project. I think we should take up again design potential to harness comfort in our project. The analysis of any factor that determines comfort brings out principles that can turn out in architecture creativity. I can't hide showing my preference to shooters, adjustable windows or parasol for a facade and giving them prominence in the design more than hiding air conditioning units on flat roof and closing the building with curtain wall facade. This attitude is because we understand how we can manipulate air, either applying complex concepts of thermodynamics or simply applying basic knowledge of convection, radiation, and air circulation through temperature differences. Thermal imbalance is precisely the requirement for devices to have a positive effect in inner climate. Also, it happens to be stimulating for life of users. Additionally, we design simple devices to adapt comfort parameters, which bring distinctive elements to architecture and result in buildings with architectural character of this latitude. In the matter, we think it is responsible to use human's body tolerance and adaptation to little variation in temperature and humidity, typical of an unbalanced atmosphere, rather than creating an artificial standardized climate constant all year long that isolates the building from its surrounding and is much more expensive. We have confirmed that building with more design than technology have important savings, superior comfort, and improvement of its users' health and coexistence. Furthermore, their impact of the environment is reduced. I have showed you my small scale buildings with more design than technology as an architecture of resources that are mostly harnessing comfort through climate and are passive building for active people. And for being in the tropical latitude, they belong to the poetic vision of architecture in light of shade. Now I'm going to change my hat. Now goes my presentation 
with my second hat as director of the Institute for Tropical Architecture. Identification of the problem. Many cities have been deteriorated, affecting the quality of life of their inhabitants and leading to harmful consequences for the environment. The motives of this are well known, but it is enough to mention migration and urban population growth, the greenhouse effect gas emissions, the irrational production and accumulation of garbage, and many other reasons as out of control as they as this. The corrective actions are technically possible and known, but political determination and the pressure of economic interests make their application complicated and particularly slow. It is interesting to think that the existence of these problems are often brings out businesses opportunities that depend on the problems and do not try to eradicate them but to perpetuate them, to initiate then new deals. Thereby, reliance is made between causes and effect, and it struggles to preserve the problem in order to uphold the businesses. Among known cases are waste treatment and insecurity. Facing the fact, and with weak institutional strength in the democratic Costa Rica, it is very difficult to get rid of these urban problems responsible for many negative aspects of life in the city. Many times, the corrective action focus on minimizing the effect and not in eliminating the causes. With this in mind, I cons and considering the magnitude of problems and the little time in an architect's life, we have thought of urban acupuncture as a possible solution for our reality and some larger project we have done with San Jose Municipality. Among them, urban acupuncture for San Jose, the first stage of San Jose Posible, which is part of the resettlement plan and the Floresta Urbana that was proposed in 2007 and it is going to start this year. Floresta Urbana a possible solution. San Jose is a very dynamic city with an unpopulated downtown in which more than a million people work daily. 80% of them take the buses of public transportation to get. Floresta Urbana attempt to improve the quality of life for these million people by introducing significant changes in transportation and public space to make more attractive the downtown's repopulation and to create incentives for private investment in medium-sized apartment buildings and facilities. Floresta Urbana is a project that is based on the most inexpensive and most effective resource we have in the tropic. I mean the trees and nature resilience. Resilience, resilience. Floresta Urbana seeks to create within the urban fabric of the city a green work that makes a new urban ecosystem and interconnects it with the rich and vital ecosystem of the central plateau that surrounds San Jose. In other words, it is the application of resilient effect to urban design. Since I came into contact with the tropical latitude more than 38 years ago, I understood that the tropical nature had to be part of architecture and urbanism, and that landscape was meant to be understood not as decorative greenery, but as a complement of human intervention into the city. This proposal of tropical city was thought to create new urban spaces with elements that take advantage of renewable tropical resources. The idea is to accomplish a more sustainable urban design that can be repeated and as an eco or reverberation 
in other cities of the tropical latitude to conquer a real planetary benefit. For us, sustainable is equal to replicable. Costa Rica is characterized for having more species than other tropical regions. You can see there, it's very interesting. With only 0.01% of the territory of the planet, Costa Rica has 5% of the total biodiversity described. Then it's a very rich territory. San Jose is set in an intermontane plateau at 4,000 feet above sea level. It has a mild and healthy climate characterized by spring all year round with dry and rainy season. The temperature ranges between, as I said, 62 and 77 Fahrenheit. It is to say outdoor experiences are possible throughout the years. This exceptional climate and the nature's capacity to regenerate resilient effect must be considered as passive and general resource for urban planning and architecture in tropical latitude. As been our practice, it has been our practice to affirm that the tropical latitude has its particularity that should not be ignored in urban planning processes. Let's look at two examples of this particularity and their relationship with urban spaces. First example, when we architect think of a plaza, of a piazza, we imagine immediately Piazza San Marco in Venice or La Place Vendôme in Paris, the Zocalo in Mexico City or the Plaza Mayor in Madrid or, or the Piazza del Palio in Siena. However, none of these piazzas are adapted to the urban life in the tropical latitude that requires shade, freshness, and protection from solar radiation. Second example, in cold climate, the sun calls people, and under its warmth and light, they live together. On the contrary, in the tropics, it is the shade who summons people, and under its shelter, they meet, they meet and share the same life. The plateau in which San Jose is located is crossed by two small rivers. One is in this area and the other is more or less there. Two small rivers. Two of them cross parallel about one mile away from each other. These are small green island. There are a small green island with low plant coverage for our purpose. In the area between them, located among these two rivers that run east to west, Floresta Urbana draws a vegetated network that unites this green island and reforests the deteriorated space as well as the residual spaces. To connect the different areas, there would be many non-polluting means of transportation as the one I mentioned. We recommend introducing in the existing urban structure of San Jose a vegetated network that infiltrates among the buildings. The main feature of this project is to accomplish an urban forest for a tropical city with the massive introduction of trees through groves, woodlands, urban biological corridor, piazzas with trees, and green hinges inside the city as a new vegetated network that manage extensive continuities. Connecting the new vegetated network with the built spaces is essential to obtain benefits and accomplish attractive living experiences. We have thought of this relationship as a thick and tight green urban network that gives continuity to the public space, which today is visually disarticulated and dismembered. The tropical forest has been our inspiration for Floresta Urbana, 
because it is not an expensive resource. It has a rapid growth rate and it is part of the population life. We are concerned in reducing or eliminating the antagonism between urbanism and ecology, shown in the confrontation of city against nature. We want to add together both approaches for a more harmonious development with better quality of life understood as something more than a better economic status. We propose a quality of life that gives priority to vegetated public spaces, making room for the outside, so typically in this latitude, and friendly coexistence through a new landscaping, including continuous canopies on street and roadside, visual spaces, and inhabitat driven minders to transform them into urban forests integrated to the surrounding nature. For public urban transportation, we suggest the Metrobus, like in Curitiba, due to its cost benefits for quick trips and the aerial tram in the middle of the trees to combine transportation with scenic recreation and relaxation, in addition to a pedestrian network with hanging bridges over the rivers and stream to shorten distances. Intense biodiversity is a reality in the tropical rainforest in Costa Rica. And in Costa Rica has plenty of experience. Even in San Jose, there is the urban forest the in Bioecological Park. And although it is an island of 13 acres, small one, it is a great example that reassures the technical feasibility of Floresta Urbana regarding the biodiversity conservation in a city. The proximity of an ecosystem in the mountain that surround the city guarantees the development of the flora and fauna towards the green urban spaces we propose. Floresta Urbana is not a garden city, neither a model as broad acre city by Frank Lloyd Wright characterized by being low density and having multiple wide roads. Not the case of Singapore or Rio de Janeiro and in their relationship with green spaces. Singapore as the Bukitima Nature Reserve with 200 acres in the center of the urban web. And Rio de Janeiro has the Tijuca Forest that cover almost 8,000 acres. In both cities, they are green island. Climate change and floresta urbana benefits. In the global environmental aspect, contributing to the biosphere conservation, reducing the ecological footprint of the city, mitigating environmental degradation of the greenhouse effect gases, cleaning the air by trapping dust, conducting the biodiversity of the mountains. In the regional environmental aspect, retaining groundwater, controlling the wind, reducing temperature of the greenhouse effect, proving a sustainable urban biodiversity, creating urban biological corridors, recuperating the fauna, reducing environmental costs, contributing to the reduction of acid rain. In the social aspect, recuperating the pleasure of time and reducing the stress of urban life, reducing noise levels, promoting urban public orchard, bringing together the vegetated network, creating public spaces of social integration, offering recreational public transportation. In the economical aspect, attracting investment to downtown, reducing the investment in treatment related to respiratory disease due to the air quality, making more profitable depressed area by making them attractive, generating urban revenues. In the architectural urban aspect, enjoying the landscape and urban scenic beauty, balancing the constructed element with the vegetable one, incorporating 
recuperated residual spaces to urban life, creating abundant shade in urban spaces, making the city livable and more comfortable. Floresta Urbana Feasibility. Flor Costa Rica is a small country, 4,500,000 inhabitants. It's a small country with many unsettled topics in its agenda toward development. But it is fair to acknowledge that it had the strength of mind to abolish its army in, 19, in, in 1949. Its declared protected area over 33% 30, uh, over, over of its territory. It is considered the fifth country in the planet to protect its natural resources. It produces 93% 93, 93 of its electricity with renewable energy sources, 93%. A recent census showed that 70% of population of a province voluntarily classify their garbage. It has water reserve of almost 28,000 square meter per person, a uh, cubic meter per person. It has health and life expectancy indexes as European countries, but with a modest income per capita of $4,000. In 2007, the peace with, nat with the Nature Initiative was enacted. It aims to make Costa Rica the first carbon neutral country. A few years ago, it stopped deforestation, and now it is the country with more trees per capita in the world. Considering this extravagant background, it is easy to expect a project as Floresta Urbana created for San Jose, the capital, to be replicated in other cities of the country. It would be a good example for other tropical cities too. It would help to transform them in green and sustainable city, and it would contribute to mitigate climate change. The fund for the massive accomplishment of Floresta Urbana could come from the following initiative. The sale of carbon storage environmental ecoservices is something Costa Rica was pioneer with its first sale in 1997. Today, there are 1,500,000 acres of forest under this system with incomes of around $30 million per year. It is estimated that the maximum national potential of this program is $100 million dollar per year. This money comes from highly pollutant nations and companies that enforce social responsibility to this program. Recently, Costa Rica is promoting the new program of Sustainable Biodiversity Fund to step up in the sale of environmental ecoservices. The reasoning that supports this initiative is that one hectare of tropical rainforest contains higher biodiversity rate than a forest with reduced biodiversity as monoculture forest. This new fund will allow to sell more expensive bonds and to acquire more benefits in order to protect the planet biodiversity and not just support forest conservation. To accomplish the economical feasibility of Floresta Urbana, we at the Institute of Tropical Architecture recommended a new fund for sustainable urban biodiversity. Sustainable urban biodiversity that besides promoting the environmental benefits in biodiversity, it would attack the source of pollution with an immediate positive result in the place where it is originated. The application of this fund 
to the city will allow Costa Rica to increase the amount of the canon that is today, that is paid today, and obtain more incomes for protected urban acre. These new incomes will be invested in urban improvements to create unique cities in this gender. As society becomes more urbanized, its inhabitants disconnect from nature. Floresta Urbana pretends to integrate the nation, the nature with the city and promotes the sale of profitable environmental eco-services bonds, enhancing urban biodiversity. We are aware that in Costa Rica we cannot pretend technological feats, but we sure can do environmental audacities. Thank you very much. My question is, uh, has to do with the climate and how you react to the climate. That's because you showed in the beginning a map where Florida was in the region of the tropics. Other climate maps that I've seen on the web, like the Kuppen, put Florida in the subtropics. So apparently Florida is in a liminal um, area of the world and I think there are other areas of the planet that are both in the tropics and in the subtropics too which complicates design and another complication is climate change itself which changes the premises by which architects are going to have to design because buildings last for at least 50 to 100 years when South Florida is probably going to be underwater anyway um, so how do you work in a liminal place like Florida that has both climates? Um, give me a project and I will tell you. <laughs> no, you know, uh, <laughs> more seriously, you are, your question is a very important question. But um, um, I have uh, two ways to answer it. One is that uh, the, the limits, the boundaries of the climate are changing. Um, apparently, apparently, the tropical belt of the planet is enlarging, apparently. That means that uh, if today we're living in a dry area perhaps tomorrow we will not live in anymore. In, uh, in our house, for instance, um, we have now, since uh, three years ago, mosquitoes. We live at, um, um, on the higher part of the, of the um, plateau in, in, uh, in Costa Rica. And uh, now it's um, warmer than it used to be. Then uh, we have to install screens. That uh, is, a, is, a, uh, um, um, is a fact that uh, the climate is not always the same. The other thing is that uh, design and architecture is not a scientific matter. And uh, when we design a building or a space where people live, um, I, think, I think it's a mistake to create an artificial indoor climate in order to control all the, um, the, um, the, um, the, the data uh, of, the, of the microclimate. I think that, uh, and this is a fact, that uh, the human body has the, cap the capacity of uh, adaptation and tolerate different temperature and uh, different uh, um, um, 
percentage of humidity. For instance, um, you know that uh, we have to to have inside the buildings a temperature and uh, and uh, and um, humidity percentage that is uh, very very uh, stable, and the data of that is that you you have to have 77 Fahrenheit, it's 24 centigrade, and 50 percent of uh, humidity. But if you go and to see some research done by German laboratories in uh, tropical areas like uh, Thailand, in office building and schools, the level of tolerance is in uh, centigrade 28 and not 24. And uh, the, um, the tolerance of uh, the percentage of relative humidity is not 50, it's 80. And with the combination of 80 with 28, you feel uncomfortable. Okay, what that means? It means that you are losing uh, energy, it's a waste of money, because when you move one centigrade, I don't know in Fahrenheit how, it, how much it is, but in the thermostate, when you move one centigrade low, you, at that moment, you start consuming 10.5% more electricity. That means that if you can support, don't say 28, but 27, 26, you are saving 20 or 30 percent of the electricity. Remember that some years ago, Japanese that are very clever allowed people to go work without tie. And then they move their air conditioning thermostat two degrees up. Then they save 20 percent of the electri electricity consumption. I think we have to we have to look very carefully of those data because when we we talk to uh, a mechanical engineer and uh, that is a friend of you uh, that is a friend of you he will recognize that they over design all the systems this is a big problem and the other thing that is really a problem is when we live in the tropics and uh, we feel cold in an auditorium and we need to wear a sweater or a scarf, we are losing money. We are losing money. Pavarotti, when he went to think in Panama, Panama is the coldest country in the world. You know? because of the air conditioning. <laughs> yes, yes, he got, he got sick on the throat, Pavarotti. He couldn't think in the next step that was Costa Rica. <laughs> we lose the money, we lose our money, our, our ticket money, because we couldn't think. You know, we have to think. Don't, don't uh, um, um, take all those aspects as granted. Questions? Okay. <laughs> what is the current status of the Flores Urbana project? Wait, I'm sorry, speak in the mic. What is the current status of the Flores Urbana project? Okay, it's, um, it's interesting. We, we had a two, one year and a, and a half we are one year and a half behind because of the re-election of the mayor. <laughs> now that uh, it, he was re-elected, um, he is ready to start, and uh, he organized with the bank um, what uh, I mentioned, the biodiversity fund, 
uh, for the city, then uh, the bank will sell bonds to uh, local companies. But uh, what we would like to do is to have this conception of urban biodiversity to be um, uh, applied in all over the world, because what we need is to re-establish the planet equilibrium. Uh, it is, I show, you know, I show, I show, and this, this is not fair, but uh, I have to apologize with Norman Foster, because uh, he's a fantastic architect, my respect for him, but uh, we cannot afford this kind of, uh, of buildings in a tropical belt, and if we want to re-establish the climate equilibrium of the planet, it's not with this kind of project we are going to do it. The only possibility is that we architects design could be copied freely by the entire population in order to get advantage of what we design. But now I have a friend who is working in a project in London and the cost for square meter is $22,000. Square meter, $22,000. It's, it's impossible. I think it's fantastic and when I saw this kind of building, I laughed because they're a fantastic building. I enjoy seeing a Richard Rogers building, a Norman Foster building, a Renzo Piano building, fantastic buildings. But they don't have the possibility to be replicated and to share the benefits they have in the tropical planet, in the, in the tropical belt of the planet. Then the impact, the, if we want a, a positive impact with architecture, we have to think in low cost architecture. And this is our challenge. If not, we architects we are going to. <laughs> I agree with you that we should make green cities, especially here in Florida. You go to the beaches and you see very few palm trees. And we are losing the sand. We are constantly dredging to get larger beaches. And it's as simple as planting more palm trees and more landscape. And we don't do it. And what you see a lot is um, people in the main streets, they repave. Rather than provide more green space, they are spending this money in pavers. So it's a shame that locally we are not becoming more green. Even in, when we recycle, we are doing a good job with the paper, with the cardboard maybe with styrofoam in the supermarkets, but none of us are really, or very few of us, are recycling the batteries, the light bulbs, that paint or chemicals, the really main sources of pollution, we are not um, paying attention to. So I'm very happy to see the greenery, the job that you're doing in Costa Rica, it's fabulous, and I hope it spreads, especially locally, if we can each do it wherever we live, we would uh, have a better world. Even with our lunch boxes, we were wasting all this cardboard, you know, instead of just serving us, it was a very nice lunch, but instead of just serving the sandwiches on a tray, we don't need to waste cardboard. So we all can improve daily yeah. on what we do. Thank you. Thank you. I would like just to say something very short. Reset, reset. <laughs> Reset, um, um, I got in contact with a uh, lead some years ago and um, we studied very carefully and we decided that uh, um, it would be interesting to think about um, a particular norm for the tropical countries. And of course we started with Costa Rica. And uh, two years ago, we decided to try to create our own norm. And uh, in December, we finished that norm. 
the, the, we wrote the norm, and uh, it has been incredibly uh, fast, but now um, the authority asked to uh, transform this norm in a national norm in order to certificate buildings um, in the next uh, month, two, three, four months perhaps. Now that the norm is finished um, according to our ideas, we're working very hard with uh, lawyers and authorities in order to have the, to establish this norm. And what is the characteristic of this norm? Is that the main issues are design and how the building um, um, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is put it on the, on the floor, the arrival of the building on the floor. Those are very important aspects in uh, tropical montaneous countries. And uh, those are the main, the main topics of reset. Thank you. I want to thank you, Bruno, for that very inspiring presentation, and uh, in particular for answering my question uh, about reset, which I found quite fascinating. Um, they began with a concept called lead tropical uh, until he got a phone call from Rick Frederizzi warning him of the use of the word lead. Uh, but I think that's interesting because we need to develop a norm that is suitable to our climate uh, and really look critically at uh, any tendency to establish a norm that really doesn't suit our needs. And so I commend you on that, and I hope that we can share that knowledge. Um, tomorrow morning, we will have a, a keynote speaker, Andres Duani, uh, on the 11th floor of the FAU Tower, where the sessions were held today. And tomorrow uh, afternoon at 4 o'clock, we'll be hearing from Guy Nordenson uh, from Princeton University, structural engineer. And so uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you. We've wrapped up today, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.